Welcome everyone. Hello. It is our lunch and learn here with our adventure around America today. And joining me is Ranger Shannon. Hey, Ranger Shannon. Hey, everyone. We are glad to have you with us. A couple of quick notes. Friends, classrooms, um, if students, if you're on your own device and you're posting questions in the chat, we welcome those. Teachers, if you would collect voices from the room of the questions they have, go ahead and type those in the chat. Uh, Tana, who's also here on the call with me, we are going to be moderating the chat and passing those questions over to Ranger Shannon. And students, if you're on your own device and typing, just remember those good digital citizenship skills. We want to keep it positive, friendly, and focused. So without further ado, I don't know, Tana, I'm excited for this today. How about you? Yes, I'm so excited. I'm so glad you're, you're joining us for this learning opportunity as um, every kid can visit a national park. And I love the representation for your park. It has a special kind of uniqueness about it that um, some of our other parks know. So I'm so excited to learn along with our students today. And thank you for um, making this learning opportunity available to our, our students, um, Ranger Shannon. I really, really appreciate it. All oh, right, absolutely. Students. Of course. Teachers, my, here we go. Yep, we'll hand right, it over to Ranger Shannon. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, Okay, so um, my name is Ranger Shannon, and I am a park ranger at Mesa Verde National Park. And I am here today to talk about some of the puzzles of the past. We're going to be thinking about the past in a lot of different ways today and learning about this place. Today, I'll be asking a couple of different kinds of questions. Um, so one type of question I'll be asking are just yes or no questions. So when I ask that type of questions, um, you can just maybe put one of your reactions that you have uh, like a thumbs up or something like that to say, yes, you understand. So let's just give that a try real quick with your reactions in the chat. Um, when I popped up on the screen and you saw me, could you tell that I was a park ranger? It seems like we're getting quite a few people that are saying yes. Okay, absolutely. Um, and then our second kind of question is where I will ask a question that actually requires a response. And for that, I want you to work with your moderators that, are, that I'm working with that are going to give me an answer from someone, okay? So let's try one of those kind of questions. So one of those kind of questions would be, how could you tell that I was a park ranger when I popped up on the screen? Who would like to answer that? Oh, good question. It'll take them a moment to type in their responses, but how do you know that Ranger Shannon is a national park ranger? What are the clues that you see here? Type those in the chat, friends. We're watching. And here they come. Already noticing maybe some context clues around the things that Ranger Sh Shannon's standing in front of. We're noticing a couple of pieces there. Hmm, still typing some ideas. We are we are noticing that you wear a badge. Yeah, absolutely. I've got my badge and my name tag that I wear for sure. Hmm. I see some people with um, maybe it's kind of a very unique hat. Is your yeah. hat symbolic we, of a ranger? So that's another one I saw. We call this hat, we call it the flat hat. And that is the classic ranger hat, which I'm actually going to take off because I am in our, vir our virtual studio right now, and it's a little hot in here. Um, okay, so we've got the hat, we got the badge, really just, yeah, my whole uniform. This is the uniform of the park ranger, so that you can tell that I work for the National Park Service and that you can trust me, and I'm here to give you information about things. So good job with that first question. Let's go ahead and move right on into the program. So I've got another question all ready to start off for everyone. That question is, where is Mesa Verde National Park located? Who thinks they can answer that question? That's that's a good question. Hmm. It takes about 15 seconds for that we give them a chance to do their typing and then sure. it should pop in there. So yeah, stay tuned. Oh, I can stay wait, tuned. no problem. <laughs> All right, students, where do you think Mesa Verde is in? Oh, they are wondering if you might be in the West. 
Yes, okay. We're getting warmer. Very good. We are in one of what we would call the Western states. We're also noticing maybe you're in a place where it's hot. It can be hot, but it's not hot right now because it's winter time here. Hmm. Are you in the desert? We're getting closer, okay? We're in the high desert. So we're in Colorado. Most nice. people don't think of the desert when they think of Colorado. They think of the big tall mountains, right? But we are actually located all the way down in southwest Colorado. So as southwest as you can get in Colorado is where we are. And in that area, it's called the Four Corners area. That's because it's where four states all meet perfectly right together right here. So we've got Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, right where all the states meet. And it's in Southwest Colorado where you will find Mesa Verde. Here's a picture of Mesa Verde. And Mesa Verde is Spanish for green table. Kind of looks like a table a little bit, right? Because mesas are flat topped hills with steep sides all around. Everyone that's watching right now, I want you to do this with me and say this with me too. A flat topped hill with steep sides all around. Good. Okay, we're going to do that one more time. A flat topped hill with steep sides all around. Very good. And yeah, it's the high desert. We're at 7,000 feet, but it's still pretty dry here. And it's within yeah. that big mesa that we talked about where there are many canyons. So Mesa Verde isn't actually just one mesa. It's lots of mesas with canyons that go down in between them. It's inside of these canyons in the cliffs that we find the cliff dwellings that we are so famous for. People come from all around the world to see these ancient homes. Which brings me to my next question. Oh wait, so my next question is, can you see this cliff dwelling? It's hard to see. Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. It's pretty small, right? This was a home where people lived. And to get into this home, you would have to travel up and down the rock face to get into your house. What an amazing place to live. And today, we've built these big ladders so visitors can come and explore these amazing ancient homes with us. But it would have been a lot more difficult to get into these homes a long time ago. Some of them are kind of small, like that little strip we saw on the last home but some of them are huge. This is a cliff dwelling called Cliff Palace. And it is the largest home built inside of a cliff anywhere in North America. And it is really, really old. Over 800 years old, in fact. So that brings me to another question. Who built these cliff dwellings? What do you guys think? Who can put something into the chat? Who do you think built these places? A good question. 800 years ago, you said, right, now, Shannon? About 800 years ago is when the cliff dwellings were built. Hmm. They are wondering. They're very fascinated around how it looks like an underground city and that sort of thing. Totally. So we're still coming up with our answers. It'll be just a quick second. Of course. Oh, they think the native tribes built those. Ah, uh, yeah. Good job. Very, very good. Yes, an ancient Native American tribes built these. And today we call those people the ancestral Pueblo people. So here's a picture of what Cliff Palace might have looked like 800 years ago when people were living inside of that village. That village is over 150 rooms. So there probably would have been 100 or more people living down inside of the cliff dwelling. And we call them the ancestral Pueblo people 
because they are the ancestors to modern Pueblo people. So ancestors are just anyone in your family line that comes before you. So these people in the, in the painting were ancestors to modern Pueblo people. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Pueblo people that live all over the Four Corners area of the Southwest. And they come to Mesa Verde to teach us about their culture and to visit where their ancestors lived so long ago. Okay, so our next activity that we are going to look at, I want everyone to think about your home. You can even close your eyes if you want to. I'm gonna close my eyes so I can picture my house better. Maybe you live in a house, an apartment. Imagine going in your front door. Imagine what inside of your home looks like. Take a tour in your mind through your house. Look in the kitchen, the bathroom, the bedroom, the living room. I want you to think about what is your favorite object in your whole house? What's your favorite thing that you own? Something that's really, really, really special to you. And I want you to think about where it is in your house and why it's so special to you. Think about that for a minute. And I want you to write your favorite object that is most special to you in the chat and then here in a minute we'll hear about them but I'm going to give you a minute to write good thinking I'm going to give you a little bit of time to write and then before we hear about your favorite objects I'm going to tell you about my favorite object Ask the question once more. What is your favorite object? Your favorite, most special thing that you own? And think about why it's special to you. So one is saying they're pets. Absolutely. Well, here, hang on one sec. I'm going to show you mine first, and then we'll talk about some of the students. Okay. Sound good? Okay, thank you. Okay, mine, it's actually pretty big. So I didn't bring it here with me. It's actually at my house, but I do have a picture of it that I can show you. Maybe you could try to guess what it is. Oh, I have a picture of my guitar. And this is my favorite object because I love to play music. And it's really special to me as well because my mom is a guitar player and a singer and we like to play music together. She taught me how to play the guitar. And one of my favorite things to do is play music with my friends and my family. And that's why my guitar is my favorite object. Okay, so I heard someone had said pet. Your pet's your favorite object. Well, yeah, I mean, you love your pets, of course, and they're so fun and so great to spend time with. What's another one that someone said? Uh, another one said their iPhone. Ooh, iPhone. So iPhones are great. I, of course, have a phone too that I like to use to stay connected, to call my friends and family, or stay in touch online, definitely. Anyone else? We have a couple people that have special objects like a baby blanket or a special stuffed animal from a family member. So not just the object, but who gave it to them. There's several of our of our students that are sharing about like um, yeah. Eleanor has a stuffed pig that an uncle gave her. For sure. Some of our favorite objects, it's not even usually like because the thing's expensive or that it is something that's so rare, but it's about the memories that are involved with you who gave you the object or how you got it or how it connects people together. And I think that is really just awesome. So I want you to think about this, okay? I want you to think about your house that we imagined a little bit ago and all of the objects that are in it, including your object. Just imagine 800 or 1,000 years from now. What? your house might look like a thousand years from now. Imagine if someone came to visit your house in a thousand years. Maybe it would become a national park. That's what happened at Mesa Verde. 
These are homes where people lived a very long time ago that eventually became a national park. If someone came to your house and it was very, very old and they looked at it and they said, huh, I wonder what all these things are. Would they even know what an iPhone is a thousand years from now? Would they know what the stuffed pig represented? Or would my guitar even exist a thousand years from now? Those are good things to think about. So what we're going to do, we are going to zoom into the future a thousand years to look at what maybe what your homes might look like a thousand years from now with a visitor visiting them as a national park. When we watch this from the future, you might need to adjust your volume up a little bit. So be ready for that, okay? So we are going to zoom into the future and watch this video. Oh, Ranger Shannon, we don't hear anything, so you may need to narrate for us. Okay, give me one second. I think I'm just uh, having a, uh, just a moment. I might need just to wait just a second. All good. Um, okay, I'm going to need to restart the program. I'm sorry about that. I've never had this happen before, but just give me one second. This should just take one minute. All good. But I'm very curious about what, if we went to the future, what would people say about the objects in our house? This is a great I question. Know. It's a lot of the things that, that we look at from the past. We're going to talk about here in a little bit, the way that we study them and how we know about things from the past. Well, be good detectives. There we go. Okay, let's. We're gonna try it again, and you let me know if um, we're getting volume. Perfect. Not so much, but if you can just tell us what's going on, that's fine too. Absolutely. So this is a visitor from thirty twenty two that has these really amazing glasses that help you to see into the ground, to see all the objects that are located beneath the surface. And you know where the glasses came from? They came from Amazon. So she is looking into the ground in a Marican town. She's taking a look around. Oh, she's found her first object. She's seen tile. And a throne. She says she must have found the American Queen's throne room. Amazing. She must have been queen of this town in 2022. She's going to try to find some objects beneath the surface. Oh, look what she's found. Oh, it's so beautiful. I think she knows what it is. It's a necklace. It's a necklace that belonged to the queen. Oh, doesn't she look beautiful? She looks like she lives in the 2020s. Oh, let's see what else she can find. Ooh, what could this be? Huh. 
I think she knows. Ah, uh, it's a crown from the Mary Can Queen. Wow, they sure were stylish back in the 2020s. Oh, look, she's found something else. What an interesting object. Ooh, smells pretty good. Yeah. This must have been a scepter that the American Queen used when she was giving people orders. Doesn't she look official? What else is down there? Ooh, a plastique effigy? They don't use plastique anymore in the in the three thousands. The queen must have made that made this to represent her favorite pet. She'd really like to keep all this cool stuff, but but she's going to need to put it back because a park ranger told her she has to leave it behind. Okay, bye-bye, pet. Put this scepter back. Oh, she hates to take that beautiful necklace off. Oh, gonna leave the crown as well. It's been nice talking to you guys. She's heading off to find other things from the past. Ooh, that must be the living quarters. All right, my friends, we are now going to zoom back to our present day where we are located in the 2020s. Okay, so that video was pretty silly. Do you agree? <laughs> Yeah, so this shows us a little bit about what might happen if someone were seeing things from the past, but also just jumping to conclusions. So she thought she was in a throne room, but uh, what room was she at in? Go ahead and write it in the chat if you think you know what room she was in. They're feeling pretty confident. It's the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, because she was jumping to conclusions. She was wearing a toilet seat for a necklace, thinking it was the queen's necklace and that it was a throne room, but it was actually the bathroom. That is a good lesson about what happens when we jump to conclusions. So we're gonna learn more about different ways we learn about the past and we make educated guesses about things from the past, not jumping to conclusions. Okay. so. I want you to think about ways that we learn about the past. This doesn't have to be a thousand years ago. This could be ways that we learn about the past a week ago or a month ago or five years ago. If you can think of any way that you can learn about the past, go ahead and put it in the chat. What are ways that we can learn about the past? Hmm, great question. Looking at objects, like you said, might be tough it's interesting but how do we learn about the past is objects a part of that that is one of the questions do we look yeah, at other absolutely objects? for sure looking at old objects is one of the ways we learn about the past who else has another way still coming in they're also wondering if we look at fossils Absolutely. Paleontology is the study of fossils in the past. But seriously, think about ways we can learn about the past today or last week. Not ancient things, even necessarily. So pictures? Absolutely. Looking at old photographs. Um, research? For sure. We can research in books and read books. 
We can research online as well. Okay. Any others? Um, talking to other people who might be experts. Absolutely. So I'm going to show you some of the ones I have on my list. Okay. Textbooks, for sure. Reading about the past. Newspapers are a really good way to read about the past, too, because they have very specific days when things happen. Letters. We don't use those as much anymore, but they used to be really important for communicating. Photographs. Good. We said that one. I know that I've seen some photographs of my parents and my grandparents from the past that they look pretty silly in. And I know there's some of me, too. So photographs are a great way to learn about the past. Stories. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, you know, talking to other people, teachers, your parents, grandparents, older siblings, friends. You can learn about the past that way. And then, like we said, looking at old cultural objects or artifacts to learn about the part, uh, learn about the past. Really good. So today we're going to move forward with how we piece together the puzzle of the past. We're going to be talking about archaeology and traditional knowledge. First, we're going to get into traditional knowledge a little bit. I think you know, we all know what tradition, what knowledge is. It's something you know or something you understand. But what are traditions? Go ahead, and if you think you might know what a tradition is, go ahead and put that in the chat, and I'll hang out a minute and wait for you guys to type. Traditions, that is a word that maybe we also hear at certain times of the year. Sure, absolutely. Traditions, they also might have a clue around this if it's something um, that your family does together. For sure. Answers are still being written. Of course. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> Lori thinks that uh, traditions happen once a year, like Christmas. That's definitely true sometimes. And Christmas um, and holidays definitely are traditions. Celebrations and things that you pass down. Very good. OK, I'm going to take those two definitions and I'm going to put them together and I'm going to expand on them just a little bit. Really good. So a tradition, OK, is an activity, event or a belief that is passed down from one generation to the next. So, yeah, absolutely. It could be holidays for sure. Um, or this is something I think is a good representation. This is a granddaughter having her hair done by her mother who the grandmother is doing her hair and they're doing it in the same way. So that is an activity that's been passed down. So traditions don't have to be big holidays every year. They can be simple things that happen every year. So Pueblo people that have lived in the Southwest for thousands of years have lots of amazing traditions. So we're going, we're going to watch a quick video so you can see one of the coolest traditions, which is ceremonial dances and songs that are performed by Pueblo people in the Southwest. And um, uh, Diane, if, if you're not getting any audio, just let me know and I can give a little bit of a narration about it. Sure. Oh, we've lost, oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, no audio, but go ahead. You'll can narrate okay. it for us. So there is some traditional drumming going on and some noises of shakers and people singing traditional Native American songs. This young dancer's name is Damari, and he is from one of the 21 Pueblos in New Mexico. He is dancing as a hunter in this dance and he's dancing with the buffalo. In this dance, he is making prayers to the grandparents and he is making prayers for rain and for prosperity. He was dancing so hard that it rained.
And he says at the end, I love dancing and it makes me really happy. So there are many amazing traditions of the Pueblo people that have been passed down for hundreds or thousands of years in the Southwest. One of them is farming. The Pueblo people have farmed corn as their major crop for hundreds and hundreds of years. And while the way that they farm it may have changed, today they're using pickup trucks. And back in the days, whenever people lived at Mesa Verde, they would be using baskets on their back to carry corn. They're still farming that corn and cooking many traditional foods using dishes they would have farmed like corn, beans, and squash. So many of those traditions have been passed down. So now that we've talked a little about traditional knowledge, we're going to talk about what is archaeology. So please, if you think you have an idea and you can help me with a definition of what is archaeology, put it in the chat. What is archaeology? Ooh, some of us are thinking Indiana Jones. Okay, that was definitely a film archaeologist. Digging in the dirt. Okay, digging in the dirt. Okay, that's part of it for sure. An archaeologist studies the past. Very good. Okay. They study history. They're scientists as well. Absolutely. They're scientists. So check this out. I'll give you a little bit of my de definition. Okay. It's a way of learning about the past by looking at the things people made or left behind. So it's got to be people, things, and from the past, right? So, like we were talking about our favorite object, in a thousand years, an archaeologist might find that, and then they, as part of their scientific study, would be thinking about that. But archaeologists make observations using their senses. Then they look at the context of where an item maybe was found, where what was going on around where the item was found, and then they make an educated guess. They do not just jump to conclusions like our friend here was, because when you jump to conclusions, you're usually wrong. You make observations, you make uh, uh, observations about the context, and then you make an educated guess, which is exactly what we are about to do to piece together the puzzle of the past. We're going to look at three items. We are going to make observations about the items, okay? That does not include guessing what the object is, okay? So an, ob an observation would be using one of your senses, but today you're just going to be using your sense of sight, okay? So if I were to show you this object, or how about this? If I were to show you this object, you might say some observations could be, it looks like it has writing on it. It looks like it's blue. It looks like it's rough. It looks like it is maybe made of fabric, but guessing what it is would be, it looks like a bag. Okay, so we're not gonna guess what it is. We are gonna make some visual observations first then we'll learn about the context, then we'll get a chance to make an educated guess. Okay, let's get right into it. Our first object, before I pull that out, I'm gonna put on my white gloves. Any idea why maybe I'm putting on these white gloves? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat. We think you need to protect your hands. Well, it's, it's yes for that, but it's also to protect the objects because we have oils on our hands. And if I touch these old objects lots and lots of times, the oils from my hands can rub off onto them and it can damage them. So we want to make sure we're protecting them. Okay, so I'm going to pull out this first object. Okay, have a look at it and you can start typing some observations in the chat. 
not guessing what it is. So Diane, for our moderator, if people are guessing what it is, I don't want you to tell those to me, okay? I just, yeah. just want observations from people. It could be the shape, it could be the color, it could be distinguishing features, what it's made from. It could be uh, its texture, lots of different things you could, you could uh, make observations about. They're noticing that it has patterns. Yeah, okay, we're noticing that it has some patterns, very good. We're noticing that it is gray in color. Yeah, it's definitely very gray here. Good observation. We'll do one more. And it's in the shape that reminds them of a bowl. Okay. That's a little bit of a guess what it is. It's round and painted. Round and painted. Good. Okay. So we've got a few good observations. So now I'm going to give you the context about where this item was found. Okay. This item was found near a natural spring, which is where water filters out through the rock and puddles in an area. Beside this object was a big jar with a handle that would be used for carrying water. Now that we've made some observations and we have a little about the context, who Please go ahead and put your educated guess what you think this object is. I think it's a bowl. We're getting close, but it's not a bowl. Because it's broken. It's broken. There's a part of it missing. They are still putting ideas in there. Because some more observations. They think it sure. looks like it's made of cement. Yeah, it looks like it's made of maybe some type of stone. Mm -hmm. Couple more observations while the others are typing in. They're noticing yeah, yeah, their hockey. Look, this is a picture of it when it was fully formed and not broken, right here. Oh, interesting. Okay. A pot for water? No, remember we said it was found next to a pot. Okay. Still guessing, a teacup. Um, so this is a ladle. It's missing ladle. the handle, but it's like a big spoon that you, you would use to dip water and pour it into the jug. Okay, really good job, guys. We're gonna go for another item, okay? And remember, we're not guessing what it is. And that includes saying it looks like a whatever, okay? We're just making visual observations about the object. Okay, so here's our next object. We're taking a close look. They're noticing it's black in colors. Black in color, good observation. They're noticing that there was some writing or something on the corner. There is some writing. That's something we've put there as part of cataloging it so we can keep track of this item. They notice it's small. Yeah, it's very small, good. And they notice that it, it looks like it's, well, it looks like it's an identification, but they say they're wondering, is it made of stone? There is a yeah, it, to be there. It possibly could be made of stone. Good observation. Another one says it possibly could be made of iron. Hmm. Okay. It looks rough. Rough for sure. Okay, great observations about this object. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of the context of this object. Okay. So our object was found near an unfinished wooden roof. Near this object was a hammer stone that would have been used for hammering. Any ideas maybe what this is? And I'll give you a hint, this is broken. Hmm. Yeah, they're noticing that it's broken. 
a lot of them brought that piece forward. But this was a part of a roof area, you said? It was found near an unfinished wooden roof, and near. beside it was a hammer stone. Okay. One thinks it might be a nail. Hmm. That's a good thought because when I say hammer, it makes you think of nails. I will tell you, it's not a nail. Another one to know if it is a hammer. Not, it's very close to a hammer. Think about this. I'll give you a hint. Something that would be used to cut trees down. We even use them today still. Okay. A chisel. For cutting trees down. What do we use to cut trees down? An axe. Very good. This is a part of a broken stone axe head. You can see here and here is where the handle would attach. Just like you see in this example over here of that axe head. It's sharpened on one side and the handle attaches on the other. Here at Mesa Verde, every building was built using only stone tools. No metal tools and no metal like nails at all. Okay. We're looking at our last object. Yes, we have stone axe and our last object. Okay. Once again, we're going to make observations. We're not going to say what it looks like it is or what do you think it is? Okay. So, any observations about this? We're taking a look. We are noticing that it has a pattern. Very good, yeah, it does have a pattern. Great observation. It is brown. Very good, yes, observation of the color, it is brown. It is, has holes in it. It does have holes in it. <laughs> I can still see you. Getting a couple more responses coming in. Sure. There are different colors on the brown. Mm hmm. That's various colors of brown, some a little bit yellow, some really dark. Very good. We'll do one more observation. It looks, um, but it looks like it could be a, made of a stone or wood pattern. Ooh, or maybe made of product. a plant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's a little bit of the context about this object. This object was found just inside of a doorway to a home. And beside this object inside of the doorway, there was a pair of woven cotton socks. Now with our observations and our context, let's anyone want to make an educated guess what this object is? Miss Harvey's class feels like it could be a sandal. So good. You guys nailed it. It is a sandal made from the yucca plant that would be woven together. And here is a piece of what's left of what would have tied it onto a person's foot. Wow. I want all of you to go ahead and give yourselves a big pat on the back. Very good job thinking like archaeologists. So it's really important that we use all of our available um, information to learn about the past. We learn from traditional knowledge from Pueblo people today because a lot of their culture and a lot of their rituals and events and beliefs are the same as they were back in the days when people lived at Mesa Verde 800 years ago. But we also learn a lot by studying the archaeology, these ancient things that are left behind from the past, making observations, and learning about the context and making educated guesses. So we know that here at Mesa Verde, people lived here for over 700 years. People first moved here on top of the Mesa. Remember, we made the table and then the sides. They were living up on top for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's where most of their homes were and where they were farming. 
Does anyone remember the one crop that they farmed the most of? Can anyone put that in the chat? Corn. They farmed lots of corn and they would store corn and dry it for years into the future, just in case it was a really dry year. After living mostly on top of the mesas for about 600 years, people started to move down into and build the cliff dwellings that we're so famous for. Can anyone see any animals in this picture? What animals do you see? They're noticing a dog. Yeah, absolutely. Pueblo people in the ancient times, they had pet dogs. There's other animals in there too. Can anyone see those? Turkey. Yeah, good job. Those are turkeys. Pueblo people raised turkeys for food, for eggs, and to use their feathers to weave into blankets, much like you saw the yucca, but they would weave very fine with feathers to make warm blankets. People built using stone. All of these stone blocks were formed using stone tools like we saw earlier. And all of the wood that we used for beams, for building and for ladders was chopped down using stone axes. They were master builders. They built buildings that were two, three, or even sometimes four stories tall. The tallest buildings in all the Americas really until the late 1800s, which is pretty amazing. Only living in the cliff dwellings for about a hundred years, people started to move away from Mesa Verde. They started to go down south. Now, why did they leave? Well, it's a little bit of a mystery, but we think we have a decent idea because of a couple reasons. Studying tree rings from the past lets us know that it was really dry during this time. So maybe they were having a hard time having enough water to drink for their villages and they moved away. We also know from oral traditions that are spoken from Pueblo people that their migrations, they were looking for their eventual home and that's why they moved south. And today, there are 21 different Native American tribes that are the Pueblo people that are in New Mexico, Arizona, and even all the way down in Texas. So they took all their culture and their traditions from Mesa Verde and moved with them to their new homes down south. So thank you all so much for learning about Mesa Verde National Park today, for doing such a great job of thinking like archeologists, not jumping to conclusions and accidentally putting the toilet seat on when you think it's the necklace, but using your observations and learning about the context to make really educated decisions. So really, really, really good job for everyone today. Thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you when you come to visit me at Mesa Verde National Park. Thank you so much, Ranger Shannon. And thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you on another adventure. Have a great day, Ranger Shannon. Bye-bye everyone.